So here's lesson C of unit 3. In this lesson, we're going to be focused on something called torque and rotational statics. And what we want to be able to do is calculate the magnitude and direction of torques uh, due to forces and, to, and gravity, and also be able to state conditions for what's called translational or rotational equilibrium of a rigid object and apply those conditions in analyzing the equilibrium of a uh, rigid object under uh, combination of forces. So in order to accomplish those goals, we first have to cover some basic terms. So far, our study of physics has focused uh, almost exclusively on the particle model, which takes an, an object and reduces it down to a single point mass. Now we're going to be focused on rigid objects, or a rigid body, which is an extended object whose size and shape does not change as it moves. So an example would be like a, a bicycle tire here. So all the objects that we're going to be working with in this lesson are going to be these rigid objects. And one of our learning targets for the lesson is to state the conditions necessary for translational and rotational equilibrium. Equilibrium being uh, an object not moving. Okay, uh, We've dealt with equilibrium before already. So to understand what translational equilibrium is, we first have to understand what translational motion is. So translational motion is when an object as a whole moves along a uh, trajectory but does not rotate. So all the motions we've looked at so far, cars going down roads, the objects moving down ramps, balls flying through the air, have all been translational motions. Rotational motion is the object rotates around a fixed point, and every point on the object moves in a circle. And so a lot of motions are combinations of translational and rotational, such as an, an, an object flying through the air as it rotates. Okay? Now this fixed point that uh, an object rotates around is called its center of gravity. And every object has a center of gravity. Okay? Take, for example, this hammer. Uh, we have a, a center of gravity on a hammer. It's an extended object whose mass is not evenly distributed. If we had something like a, a 2 by 4 board, its mass is evenly distributed, and so its center of mass, or its center of gravity, would be at the center of the object. For this hammer, on the other hand, it's got a more mass at the head of the hammer than at the tail and the handle of the hammer, so its center point, its balance point, its center of gravity, is further toward the head of the hammer. And it's about this point that objects will rotate. So if I were to throw the hammer up into the air and uh, cause it to rotate, it's going to rotate around its center of gravity. And it's this center of gravity that makes uh, products like this bottle holder work. Okay, this is, It uh, holds the bottle at the bottle's center of gravity. So let's think about torque for a minute. Here I've got pictured a top-down view of a door, and there's four forces acting on the door, each of the same strength, but they each have different effects on this door. Down here is the hinge. This is the pivot point about which the door would rotate uh, with sufficient force. Now force one on here, would we can look at this and we can see that it would be the most effective uh, force for opening the door. Force two, which pushes straight against the door toward the hinge, will not open the door. Force three will open the door, but it's not as easily as force one. And what about force four down here? It's perpendicular to the door and has the same size as force one, but we know from experience that pushing close to the hinge is not as effective as pushing the outer edge of the door. If you, you know, if you can't envision this, uh, you know, pause the video, get up and try that right now. Now the ability of a force to cause a rotation depends on three factors. First, the magnitude of the force, or the size of the force. Second, the distance from the pivot point to the point at which that force is applied will affect the ability of that object to rotate. And third, the angle at which that force is applied. We uh, incorporate these three observations into a single quantity that we call torque. And basically, torque is the rotational equivalent of force. 
it measures the effectiveness of a force uh, at causing an object to rotate about a pivot point. We uh, abbreviate torque with the Greek letter tau, uh, so that is torque. Now when an object rotates, it rotates about a pivot point along a line that we call the radial line. So say this wrench right here, we could rotate it around this pivot point uh, depending on the force that we apply to it. Now as this picture shows, the force that's being applied is applied at this angle between, uh, the, there's an angle between this force and the radial line. And what's important to understand here is that the torque on this wrench then, well, what causes it to rotate, is due to the component of the force that is perpendicular to that radial line. So it will be important to remember that the force that results in a torque is due to the perpendicular component of the force that acts. So just, just because the formula here for torque says sine, theta and it doesn't mean that we're always going to use sine uh, of the angle between the radial line and the, and the applied force. You have to be certain to use whatever trig function will get you the perpendicular component of that force. Sometimes it could be a cosine. But either way this is our, our expression then for torque is that the applied force times the distance between the pivot point to the, where that force is applied or the R uh, times the sine of the angle, or the trig function of the angle. Okay, so let's look at an example here. So in trying to open a stuck door, Ryan pushes on it at a point, 0.75 meters from the hinges uh, with a 240 newton force directed at 20 degrees away from being perpendicular to the door. We want to figure out the torque that Ryan exerts on the door. So we apply our equation for torque, RF sine theta, and in our solution then, we want to remember and recognize that the angle in our torque equation is the angle between the applied force and the radial line. So we use a 70 degree angle in here and we end up with a torque of 169.1 newton meters. Okay, so here we see that the units of torque are the newton meter. So torque differs from force in a really important way. Torque is measured about a particular point of rotation. Uh, so to say that a torque is 20 newton meters is meaningless without specifying the point around which that torque is calculated. Uh, torque can be calculated around any point, but its value depends on the point chosen because this choice determines the lever arm and the angle. Okay, so in practice, we usually calculate torques around a, a hinge or a pivot or an axle. So our torque equation gives only the magnitude of the torque. But torque, like a force component, has a sign. A torque that rotates a, uh, in a counterclockwise direction is positive, while a torque that tends to rotate an object in a clockwise direction is negative. So once we determine our pivot point, any force that is applied along that radial line or along that lever arm uh, ends up with zero torque. Any force that is applied that will cause a counterclockwise rotation is counted as a positive torque. Anything, any force that would cause a, uh, a clockwise rotation any, would, be, uh, would get a negative torque. Okay, so let's see how this applies in an example. Here we've got Luis uses a 20 centimeter long wrench to turn a nut. The wrench handle is tilted 30 degrees above the horizontal and Luis pulls straight down on the end with a force of 100 newtons. How much torque does Luis exert on the nut? Okay, so here's a visual of this problem. Here's the, the wrench, it's 20 centimeters from pivot point to point of uh, the force being exerted. Uh, he pulls straight down with 100 newtons and it's this perpendicular component of that force that gives the torque and uh, with the angle between the force straight down and the horizontal and the perpendicular force is 30 degrees. Okay, so there's kind of two, po two ways to kind of go about solving this problem. First, we could calculate that perpendicular component of that force and then apply that to our torque equation, or we could go straight to our torque equation. Uh, let's look at both ways. 
with this, where we've got, if we ca calculate first the perpendicular component of the force, we'd use the 30 degree angle because that angle is between the, the applied force and that perpendicular component. We'd get this 86.6 newtons and then we could apply that to torque where it would just be RF because the sine of 90 degrees, this, is a, this would be a 90 degree angle right in here. So the sine of 90 degrees would uh, be one. So we'd end up with a torque of 17.3 uh, newton meters. Okay, so this is a little bit different when we go to apply straight to the torque equation because we have to look at a different angle. In that case, our torque, when we apply our 0 0.20 meters, our 100 newton force, we want to be looking at the angle between the applied force and the radial arm. Okay, so that would be this angle here, 90 plus 30 or 120 degrees. So we'd use sine 120 and uh, we would get the same thing, 17.3 newton meters. But that's not the full story here because as we just discussed, when this wrench gets rotated, it's going to rotate in a clockwise direction. Any torque that results in a clockwise direction, therefore, is a negative torque. Therefore, we have to insert our negative in here for negative 17.3 newton meters. And one of the conditions that we want to be paying attention to is that of static equilibrium. When forces are acting and they result in torques, those torques can add up to a net torque. To the conditions for static equilibrium are to have no net force and no net torque. Those are the two conditions necessary for a static equilibrium. So that is, in order for an, a rigid object to not move pendulum-like or rotate, both the net force and the net torque must be zero. As we go to look at static equilibrium problems, one of our challenges is going to be to choose a pivot point. When something is already moving, it's, it's easy to see what the pivot point is. But if it's in static equilibrium, it's a little bit more difficult to determine where the pivot point is. So the pivot point would be the point around which the object would rotate if it did rotate. So for example, we've got a hammer here, and this hammer is resting on two pegs. It's a peg A and peg B. So there's a peg A is a, exerting a force up on the handle of the hammer. Peg B is exerting a force upward on the head of the hammer. And then the weight of the hammer acts at the uh, the center of gravity of the hammer. But if we were to remove peg A completely, this hammer would rotate around point B, or it would rotate about point B. If we remove peg B, it would rotate about point A. Okay, So removing peg A makes our pivot point point B. Removing peg B makes our pivot point point A. And this leads us to talk a little bit about stability and balance. If we tilt a box up on one edge by a small amount and let it go, it's going to fall back down. If we tilt it too much, it falls over. If we can tilt it just right, we can get a box to balance on its edge. So what determines these possible outcomes is the center of gravity. For example, we got a, a vehicle here. If it goes up on uh, two wheels, right, uh, and it's below that center of gravity, then the car will come back down. We get up to a point uh, where that center of gravity is directly over its pivot point, then we reach what's called a critical angle. Anything past that critical angle would then cause the car to, to fall over on its side. As long as the object's center of gravity remains over the base of support, torque due to gravity will rotate the object back toward its stable equilibrium position. And we, we can say that that object then is stable. So here's an example where we have a board weighing 100 newtons sitting across two sawhorses. We want to know the magnitudes of the normal forces on the, so, uh, the sawhorses acting on the board. So this is a case of static equilibrium. The board has zero net force acting on it. And because it's in static equilibrium, it also has zero torque acting on it. 
So here's a free body diagram of this board. We have uh, normal forces N1 and N2 uh, on the board due to the sawhorses, and the W is weight of the board acting at the center of gravity. We have two distances then from N1 to that center of gravity and from N2 to that center of gravity we're calling D1 and D2. Now if we were to analyze just the forces acting on this then, N1 and N2 are in the positive direction, weights in the negative direction, so N1 plus N2 minus W equals zero. Well this is a problem for us because we have two unknowns, N1 and N2. So we have to then take a look at the torques. When we go to take a look at the torques, we want to choose a pivot point to focus on here. Okay. So when we take a look at this, imagine uh, sawhorse number one were to disappear. Okay. Then the board would rotate around this point right here. Okay. We'd have a, a weight force acting down and a normal force acting up. We would get this uh, saw this board to rotate around point N two. If sawhorse 2 were to disappear, we would have a pivot point down here. So for this problem, let's go ahead and choose uh, point 1 down here as our pivot point. So when we choose N1 down here as our pivot point, we need to take a look at what that does with our torques. So we have three forces acting here. We have three forces that can result in torques. When we choose our pivot point down here, the distance between pivot point and where the force acts is zero. So there's zero torque from that force. We have the weight force, which points downward. That is distance D1 from the pivot point. So that force would cause a torque uh, with, a count with a clockwise rotation. And normal force N2 is distance D1 plus D2 from our pivot point and that would cause a counterclockwise rotation. So for our clock, our, our counterclockwise rotation that would be D1 plus D2 would be our R, our distance, N2 would be the force, the F, and then we have a counter, or a clockwise rotation which would be negative and that would be our R would be D1 and the F, the force, would be the weight. And we end up with just one unknown in here. We can solve for this N1 unknown N2 and plug it in up here to find N1. So when we go to do that we end up with a normal force N2 of 75 newtons. We can plug that into our force equation and end up with 25 newtons. Okay. So, with static equilibrium problems, we want to be able to look at net force equal to zero and net torque equal to zero on our torques, paying attention to where we're going to choose our pivot point and which forces would result in, say, a, a counterclockwise rotation versus a clockwise rotation. And we just add those in the same way we would do forces uh, based on positive and negative direction. Okay, so there are several other examples in your uh, notes packet. Those examples, those additional examples, will be covered in a separate video um, that would be optional, uh, but we'll cover those additional examples. All right, see you in class.